since July, there's been a, a committee that's gotten together. I won't give you the name because it's long and, and over covering, but um, the selectmen, the school committee, the advisory committee, um, the town administrator, the superintendent, the schools have gotten together every other week about and it's gone over the financial picture for the town for both 11 and fiscal year 2012 and kind of tried to get ahead of the wave and understanding what we're going to be dealing with for the next couple of years. Um, we've looked at financial projections, we've talked about different issues, we've listened to the public in terms of what their concerns are, and what we hope to do is have a series of meetings where we can bring the information out to you guys, answer the questions that you want to know, and then um, if there's more questions, then we'll, we'll get those in order and get the FAQ sheets. That's another thing. I hope everyone got the two sheets that were in the back of the, um, or at the entrance of the auditorium. Um, and keep giving the information back out to you so that we can see how we want to proceed as a town. Um, in order to do some of the things that we've discussed here, you know, the word override keeps popping up. Um, there really has to be a strong effort from the community to get that done. And, um, and that's our goal here is to provide everyone with the information that we know so that we can all make educated decisions. Um, so this has been going on for quite a while. It's going to continue to go on. What I'd like to do is um, I'm going to bring up Bob Lorenzo from the advisory committee in a second. He's going to go over what we're going to be talking about here and kind of the ground rules. And then there'll be opportunities for discussion. There'll be um, you know presentations from both the school and the town side of things. And then also we're going to go over the warrant for um, that's going on at the special town meeting on the 8th. So all of that um, is what we're going to try and cover them. Bob, you want to? Thanks, Tony. So as you can see up on the board here, we have a number of objectives that we're trying to uh, introduce tonight and make your time here as productive as and informative as possible. Um, number one, you're going to see a, an overview of the current financial situation first for the town. Uh, delivered by um, Trisha Vincasey, our town administrator, and that's going to be followed by a financial overview of the school given by Bill Johnston. Um, in each of those presentations, you're not just going to see numbers, but I think you'll see some uh, pros that addresses the challenges ahead uh, for both the town and the schools, respectively, um, and then clarify, um, as you deem necessary, um, any questions or um, comments you may have around the special town meeting articles. You should have grabbed a copy of the advisory committee report. Um, so you have it in front of you and you know what's coming uh, for November the 8th and we'd be glad to clarify any, to clarify any of that for you tonight. Um, just a couple of guidelines again to make it as productive as a meeting as possible. Um, Especially during the presentations, there will be um, a, a lot of numbers um, and comments that I think we really need to listen to to really be able to grab the context. So if you can hold your questions until um, each of the presenters is done, so when Trisha is done with the town, that would be a perfect time to address uh, the town issues and similarly with the school, so this way we don't get bogged down on a particular uh, slide or so forth. So if you can hold your questions until the presenters are done, that would be great. Um, this is really, as Tony said, about information, and, and certainly everybody in the room has points of view um, about different aspects of what's going on in the town and schools or against some of the articles uh, that are before us in special town meeting. We really don't want to use tonight to debate those articles. Uh, the time for discussion and debate uh, for the town meeting warrant is on Monday the 8th, and we know you'll all be there. So tonight is really for clarification. Um, and so forth, but not necessarily for the rigorous discussion and debate on the, uh, town meet the special town meeting articles. And with that, I'll turn it over to our town administrator, Trisha Van Gaten.
we project that we're going for FY12. This is really only a broad snapshot um, of conditions right now. The will change, we're only three months into the new fiscal year. We're trying to make um, sort of informed guesses, if you will, about what we think the budget's going to look like July 1st, 2011. Um, and there's a number of components in the budget that are completely under our, out of our control. And as you can see, almost 83% of the school budget is made up of salary. On the town side, 53.5% is made up of town salary. And that includes enterprise funds, which I'll explain um, very briefly in a little bit as we go forward. And then fixed costs dominate the um, other remaining town side of the budget. But those fixed costs are shared between the town and the school on roughly a 66%, 33% basis. What are those shared costs? Well, as you can imagine, they're sort of the big budget drivers that um, face our budget every year that are really somewhat out of our control. Some of them are determined by parties outside the town and we're just members of constituent groups like health insurance and pension. Um, local aid is a big factor, but these are the shared costs between the town and the school. The reserve fund, which is appropriated every year at town meeting in case there's an emergency or unforeseen event. Liability insurance that obviously insures all the town and school buildings and if there's a car accident with a cruiser, um, we're covered for that. Debt and interest, which is um, a shared cost for the debt that the town has for buildings and other projects like water lines and sewer lines. Pensions uh, for our school and town employees. Workers' compensation, employees injured on the job. Unemployment, FICA for employee taxes, and health insurance. And we're gonna break down a few of those in a little more detail so we can show you um, how important they do and how, how much they impact the budget when we're trying to do costs here. Um, so what did we do already? Well, on April 12th at the annual town meeting, we passed a budget, town meeting passed a budget that was just under $63 million. And as you can see from the slide, about 23 million of that is on the town side, including our enterprise funds, and a little under 28 million is the school budget. And then we have those shared costs that you just saw in the previous slide, which are around $13 million. So what was lost in the FY10, FY11 budget on the town side? We often um, get questions, the selectmen and other town departments and officials with, oh, the, you know, the school had such a heavy cut in FY11. Why didn't the town seem to be hemorrhaging as much or suffering as much? And there's a couple of factors that drove that, which I'll get into, but there were some cuts to the FY11 budget. And as you can see, we eliminated about one and a half positions. We cut from the budget two positions in the fire department that were funded, but the people hadn't been appointed to them. The beach sticker clerk was eliminated, and um, we have delayed filling a number of vacancies. The number here says six. I went back and counted this morning, and it's really eight. We have six, um, five positions in the DPW alone that we have delayed hiring as somebody retired or resigned. Um, and then there's a conservation agent position that's vacant, and there's also, um, as I said before, those two firefighter vacancies, and um, again, delaying filling in those vacancies helps our budget weather um, some cuts that may have resulted in a layoff to staff that are there with us now. More importantly, what we did, there was a new budget process for FY11, and it looked at the expense side of town department budgets in a different way. And as a result, um, there are a number of reductions to budgets that actually ended in those departments having a lower total expense budget than they did in FY10. The other thing that was mentioned too is that at the time the FY11 budget was voted at town meeting in April, the town has no, had no union contract settlements. So we had five unions on the town side <coughs> and there was no appropriation and no allowance made for uh, contractual increases for the so we are we now, we passed that budget in April 12th, and well after we passed that budget, we found out what our local aid numbers would be from the state. Then, on June 30th, at the end of the fiscal year, we were able to see how well our projections were to what we actually brought in for revenues. And those revenues are, as you can imagine, property tax and some other things. And then our new growth, which is how many new houses are built, how many people put decks or garages or a second bathroom in their house. Um, that amount of new growth revenue that we generate each year was less than we estimated. So if you take those three figures together, it 
shows that um, we have a shortfall right now in our FY11 budget of about $275,000. So that's the primary purpose why we're having a special town meeting November 8th, is because now we need to balance revenues to expenditures for FY11 before we can even think about FY12. And so what town meeting will do, and you can ask questions about this in the latter portion, is it will take $275,000 to rebalance our budget to those revenues and expenditures. It's also going to transfer um, some funds to cover projected shortfalls in budgets that we already know and to also uh, address the needs that we know about already in uh, selected accounts. There are two warrant articles that will fund union contract settlements for the professional staff in town, for the DPW, and also allowances for staff that are not in the unions. And then the other piece of town meeting town is to move forward on some energy, energy initiatives and other um, policy um, endeavors that the board has been pursuing in the past year. So let me talk really quickly about our FY12 budget process because again, even though it's nine months away, we're going to get into the thick of it starting tomorrow when budget instructions are distributed to all our department heads. We do a revenue and expenditure uh, assumption <coughs> forecast with the financial team of the town. This is separate from the financial forecast committee that the town has, which is a standing committee. Under the charter, the town administrator is also responsible for doing a five-year projected revenue and um, expenditure forecast. So we get together with the treasurer, the collector, the town accountant, and the chief assessor, and we project what we think um, some of those revenues and expenditures are going to look like over the next uh, media to several years out. And that's pretty detailed. Um, we look at um, about 24 major revenue and expenditure categories, and um, that's what we base what I think or we will have available or what the deficit's going to be for new initiatives and funding budgets in the, in the fiscal year to come. So what is driving the major, what are the major operating drivers for the budget? And as you can guess, it's our property tax levy, which is two and a half, like two and a half, proposition two and a half. That's only about a million a year. So when you think about the total town budget of 63 million, we get about a million a year in new revenue under proposition two and a half, 2.5 percent levy. And then the rest of the revenue, in addition to state A, comes from these uh, five things that you see here. And again, if local receipts are down, then that's less money that we have to move forward to fund um, increasing budgetary needs. So what's one of the biggest budget drivers? It's health insurance. And it's been health insurance, and it will continue to be health insurance. And right here is just a quick snapshot of how much the health insurance has increased for our town employees and retirees over the past um, four years. Now, if you pick up the FAQ now, if you had it or when you go out, um, one of the main questions that both school and town officials keep getting is what is the town doing around health insurance? Why aren't we joining the group insurance commission? Why are we paying so much money? So there's probably about three pages in that FAQ that sort of tries to begin to explain what is very complex and technical issue around health insurance for public employees in the Commonwealth. And if there's one thing um, that people can do to sort of help address this is to urge folks, um, their legislators, for giving municipalities plan design for health insurance. And that's not to say that there isn't a union management relationship or to health insurance, but it would just give us a lot more flexibility to try to address rising costs at the local level instead of having costs constantly forced upon us from outside sources. The town's a member of the Mayflower Health Group. It has many, many, many dozens of other communities, uh, water districts, school districts, and <coughs> These are the actual costs that they gave to us at the meeting last week. And the important thing to remember is as high as that was, uh, and these costs have been, they're being subsidized by reserves from the health insurance because they're actually even more than that. The other big driver is pension. Um, we have more um, employees that they're aging out of the town service and they're living longer. The pension um, board has really had some real impacts to it because of the double whammy of the interest income to the stock market, and also because more retirees who are going out and came at a much less deduction rate, like 5%, um, the, the pension is funding that now. Newer people coming into the, the uh, retirement system are paying as much as 11% now. But all those 
people who have been working for 25, 35 years are going out and the pension has to pay for that and the town essentially has to pay for all their employees that are part of that system. So we have some other major drivers that some of them are shared costs with the school. These costs have also gone up significantly. Some we're able to control, some we aren't. But these also are uh, drivers of the budget before we even look at one department request to say, well, you know, this is what I really need for FY12 um, in terms of what's the best thing to make my department function in all pistons and provide the services that the community has become accustomed to or would like to have. I just want to talk really quickly about enterprise funds. Most people don't know what they are. We have five on the town side. They're multi-million dollar accounts. There's some ground rules about enterprise funds. They're paid by the user. They can't be subsidized by taxation. If you go to the transfer station, you pay a fee for that. If you go to the um, golf course, you pay a fee for that. We do charge off indirect costs for that, so the accountant's time, the treasurer's time spent on those enterprise funds is charged off. Um, utility costs are paid by the towns into the um, enterprise funds. They're a big chunk of the town budget, but in terms of revenue and expenditures, they're self-contained units. And there's a couple of articles on the special town meeting that deal with reconciling balances on the enterprise funds. It's sort of a housekeeping thing, but um, I just wanted to briefly mention that. So what are our budget challenges for FY12? We have increasing fixed costs, which I already went through. We have an anticipated reduction at the end of local aid. We had a um, overall 6% reduction in local aid in FY11 for this FY11 budget. Um, we also had some challenges in terms of the reserves for the town because for several years um, we were using reserves to maintain services. So a lot of people ask, why is the town having a problem now? You know, it suddenly seems to come out of nowhere or whatever. We were using a lot of our free cash. We were using our overlay reserve to, uh, to, to subsidize the operating budget. That was no longer an available option to us when FY10 and FY11 rolled around. And we've changed that, those policies as we've done the FY11 and FY12 budget. We all know we have unaddressed capital needs because there's nothing left over after we meet the operating revenues of the town to sort of move forward to deal with sort of our infrastructure needs and what's the best use of our facilities. Uh, we're not on scheduled replacement for some of our equipment, like fire engines. So that's a real need that we need to address, but the dollars are limited and the pie can only be cut so many ways. We have limited potential for new revenues. We can increase 2.5% each year, but we can only raise fees so much and um, there's just a, a small parameter of which we can have <coughs> increased revenues as you saw, our local receipts like New Growth are also down because people build less and spend less when the economy takes a downturn. Um, I want to talk a little bit about staffing on the town side. Most people probably aren't aware that most of the support staff that work for the town work less than full-time hours. Most of our town departments have a full-time department head and a part-time secretary probably working 30 hours a week. And the FY09 audit that we just received actually suggested that we needed two more departments that don't even exist. We have no centralized human resources function, and we don't have a central person.
to be able to move money around in different places instead of what's happening Monday night at town meeting. We have like seven articles just to transfer money from one department to the other because this one has a little surplus and this one has a little shortfall. And we can have a much cleaner budgeting process that will also help us be flexible and maybe innovative during the year instead of having to wait once a year for an annual town meeting or a special town meeting. So what are the other budget improvements? All the budgets are performance-based now. Department heads are going to be evaluated on their ability to meet their goals and objectives identified in their budget. The budget that the advisory committee and the select men received to review contains all those goals and objectives and we monitor them throughout the year. The FY12 capital plan will have a formalized rating system that will um, objectively weigh um, competing requests in terms of what is needed to be funded in what year. We did not use any free cash to fund the FY11 budget um, in April, so now we're in a position when we were caught short with the reduction in local aid and local receipts to use that free cash now so we don't have to cut mid-year, and that's helping both the town and school side. And um, also tighter budget. We have a few new initiatives that I really want to go through quickly because even though um, it's a really tough time to be a public employee with, you know, an any employee or anybody in this economy, um, we're still trying to do more with less. And I just want to share quickly a few things with you. Um, Situate is really positioning itself to be one of the municipal leaders in uh, energy conservation and green energy. And there's just a few things here that I want to mention because three of them are happening at the Monday night town meeting. It's in terms of adoption of the stretch code, the photovoltaic bylaw, and to do an ESCO contract for energy savings in, building, in buildings. I don't want to get into the specifics of that, but these are all designed to make our buildings cleaner and healthier and cost efficient, or to determine whether or not they really might be obsolete and we need to start to look at different things. And also energy self-reliance. The wind turbine that town meeting approved a few years ago is being constructed at, in June. We have a town meeting article for a solar array at the Cash Landfill, and the Wampatuck School Project is one of the first uh, schools in the state to be part of the state's program for energy efficiency. So those are all really important things. We'll be about 60% energy efficient if all those things go through. The next thing is to improve technology for enhanced service delivery. The town has no IT department and has no IT staff whatsoever. The town accountant is doing it when she's available. We've had a technology committee in place for the last 14 months looking at all aspects of the town needs from both a customer service delivery aspect and also for our internal business functions. We funded that position at the annual town meeting for $32,000. We're asking another $15,000 at the special town meeting. So hopefully we'll get to hire someone in January to really address what is um, a, 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 something that surprised me greatly when I came 14 months ago, that we had no internal IT capacity in town hall. We debuted a new website today. It went up this morning. I encourage all of you to look at it. It's a lot user-friendly. I think your eyes won't go cross-eyed when you look at the home page. We welcome any comments on it. There's a monthly update from me that's going to be on there. Tonight's handouts will be up there. And as we go forward, any budgetary information that we can provide you will be there as well. We've also changed the golf website, and we've also put on more online payments on the website this year. This year, you'll find you can transfer station and beach tickets online. Bond rating increased. We were supposed to float a bond for about $12 million last April. And I asked the treasurer to, try to delay that one year. And the reason was it's because the reserve position and the financial position of the town was not in a healthy uh, state. And I was pretty much convinced that we would get a bond downgrade. Now, because we have not used free cash to balance the budget, because we're living within our means, and because the school department made the difficult choices in this FY11 budget, I'm very hopeful that when we float that bond in March, we'll be able to get a bond rating increase. And that will save the town a tremendous amount of money in terms of interest rates, which are already low, and we could get an even lower rate if we're able to do that. And $12 million is a lot of money, so it's an important goal to try and uh, achieve. The board is very focused on economic development and not having such a heavy reliance on our real estate tax just for residential properties. And this is one of the first things they identified when we set goals um, November of 2009. We 
we've just reestablished the Economic Development Industrial Commission. We were designated a recovery zone, which allows businesses to have certain tax credits and additional low interest loans when they borrow money. We bought Pier 44, and we have a study committee looking at that now. We have a very aggressive water and sewer infrastructure repair program that is funded by the Enterprise Fund. Our infrastructure for the water and sewer in town is in dire need of um, upgrades, and we're doing it as fast as we can, and that will also be attractive to any new businesses wanting to locate. Everybody's been to the Citroën Maritime Center. Uh, there's a proposal from Massachusetts. Massasoit Community College to build a facility in front of the landfill on the driftway, and um, we're asking for CPC money to do a feasibility study of the Gates School to see if it can be used for any um, adaptive reuses for municipal or school purposes. So where do we project we're going? I have two more slides. Um, right now, the financial team, financial forecast, what we're seeing from other communities, is we're anticipating an additional 4% reduction in local aid for FY12. You've already seen in the previous slide, we have a 13% increase in health insurance that's going to come along. Where level pension costs are expected, and we received that information from the retirement board about two weeks ago. We estimate local receipts to be flat. Our new growth came in a little bit higher than we had estimated um, at the year end from June 30th, now that it's finally been certified. But Again, it's been trending downward the last three years, so um, we're just going to keep them flat and not make any changes. And we're continuing to not use our free cash to subsidize <coughs> operating budgets because free cash does not regenerate every year. It's not reliable, so to use it for an operating budget is sort of like saying, here's you know, 100000 for this initiative in one year, and then free cash is down, and you have to cut it the next year. So for the town side right now, we have a working deficit that's projected for FY12 of $180,000. 90% of that is probably for uh, contractual increases. What we're doing at FY11 though, and you'll see on the town meeting warrant, is we're not using free cash to fund um, the union raises. 20,000 of free cash is used to fund about $75,000 for the DPW union, the non-union staff, and the um, professional staff. We are transferring funds from already appropriated accounts on the town side to fund those budgets because we've been able, through cost savings or efficiencies, to identify those savings. So we're not going to be, you know, setting ourselves up where we have to make reductions, hopefully, in later years because we're internally funding those raises. For FY12, even though that's our projected deficit, because I projected in a number for contractual increases, that will also be in our mind as we try to balance the budget for FY12. So, um, you know, I want to encourage people that we're trying to do the best with less. We're looking every day to be more efficient, but the financial picture in terms of the revenue that we have to be available to do that is much less than it was several years ago. In fact, the local aid that we're getting to the state is below the levels we were getting in FY07. So um, it's, it's really quite challenging for us ahead. And these are, again, just our best guesstimates. So they could be better, maybe, or they could be even worse, because we have nine months to go before this is a budget we have to live with. So thank you. Constituent is very fortunate to have such a strong town administrator. So, um, again, we are lucky. Um, I don't know if <clears throat> I think what we're going to do is break it up into sections. So, if you have questions regarding the, the material that we just discussed, we can field those questions now. And then we're going to go over to the school committee and they're going to talk about their budgets and their issues. And then we'll talk about the warrant. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Paul. Hi, folks. Uh, Paul Reed, Floyd with Star Valley. I, I just had a question. Uh, after going through some level breaking into the sections, but um, if I'm looking at Article 2 and, and, and just listening to uh, the town administrator, we're, <laughs> we're 274000 I'm taking 274600 for transferred from free cash. Yes. Where, where's free cash, Rep. What, what's, what's the number? In, in audit number. For 10 or 9? 
$10,000 is what is in free cash at the last audited number. Okay. And, and just so all of you know, the, the way that number, that number was much lower to start the year was about two or $300,000. The reason it's increased is because of all the cuts in, in expenditures that the town has made, that the school has made over the year, which has caused a surplus, which then flows to free cash. So, so, so I guess my question is when you're reading through the presentation here tonight, um, FY310 free cash was higher, and it's anticipated for FY11 there will be an increased allocation of the stabilization fund. In that 900, I guess what I was just trying to do is to net out the two, 276. Yeah, we need so, 600,000. So there'll be about $600,000 left after we get this year 2011 level. Okay, but now that free cash would be that level because the funding to stabilization in FY10 was only, as I'm looking at here, nine. $9,450? Right. I think you're talking that there's money allocated to stabilization because we have a Warren article in the annual town meeting that takes the difference between the levy and a cap, and that goes into stabilization. That has been reduced significantly, and as you see, it was, like over, it was over 200000 like four or five years ago, and last year it was 9000 This year we estimated to be about $40,000. Um, the free cash itself will remain unappropriated and then we'll look at what use that would be best used for in the FY12 budget. But as I sort of laid out in my presentation, the best use of that is for non-recurring one-time expenditures. So I really want to keep a large chunk of it for capital. Um, but we also have a special town meeting for the annual town meeting sometimes because we don't know how FY11 is going to end up. So we want to use that as an emergency reserve too. Right, so I guess my main question is knowing how you get to get the, the money that you allocated to the stabilization fund if it didn't occur, and then there was a shortfall of the 276, and then you're going to go back to where it increased to take it back to put it in, but you didn't put it into the stabilization to begin with. How would that affect you delaying the bond to FY12 to increase the credit quality of the bond rate? You're tying free cash to, the stable, to a stabilization allocation, and, and it's two different but I thought in here it's saying that they do look at the, your stabilization fund as part they of They absolutely do, and we have to borrow from our stabilization fund to fund our operating. It's $2.1 million in stabilization right now, and we'll probably add another 40000 to it. Um, right, I guess my major concern is in years past, uh, we were contributing a much, much higher level to the stabilization fund. I, I completely understand now where we're you know, a terrible, terrible time. But I just wanted to be clear that we're not adding that substantial amount of money to the stabilization fund. So I was just curious how it would be looked at that the bond rating might go up for some reason when you're not allocating that type of money to the stabilization fund. Well, Moody's recommends that 5% of your operating budget be in reserves such as the stabilization. We're at 4.06 right now. So in terms of the stabilization balance, we're fine. But they also look at free cash and whether you used it to subsidize your operating. And they also look at other reserves that you have in the liquidity so we have like $300,000 in our workers' compensation fund and in other areas that um, show overall fiscal health in case of a dire emergency. They also look at whether a town has passed overrides when the times got tough. So we're passing overrides to fund our capital debt. So those are all good, um, good indicators that um, we're in a better financial position than we were. We had negative free cash in FY09. Now we have $976,000. Those are all the barometers that they're going to look at. What would that negative have, have to do with the fact that we had put allocated money to the stabilization fund? It, it impacted that. Yes, it did. And then just one other question, that $40,000, how would that affect the 4.06 cash to? It's whatever, it's, it's probably going to be, you know, minute, but it's still, it's not so much the amount, it's that the town has financial policies that say, even in an economy like the one we've had, the town is still realizing it has to have reserves. It's not bleeding free cash to, you know, do it. It's making the tough choices to um, balance the budget. And so, uh, and I think we've done a tremendous job for FY11 in doing that relative to other communities. Okay, I just had two other quick questions. Uh, there were no layoffs, as I understand. It was just eight unfilled positions on the town side? One and a half layoffs for FY11. One and a half for FY11, and it's just unfilled that weren't filled. So more like attrition. In, in, in this year? If, if, if you were 6% reduction in charity last year, you're anticipating 4% this year, 
What happens if all of a sudden it happens again? What, what would be the plan? I mean, obviously, with the cuts? I have to present a balanced budget to the board in de December, and um, three of the unions still don't have contracts. So those settlements might be predicated on the department having to um, live within the contract settlement in that department, and that might need to be achieved through layoffs. And just one last thing, when I read through the GIC, I know you guys know I'm familiar with the GIC, and that we've talked about for years, but it would appear from this handout that because of the intricacies and the complexities with the town is situated, it might not be something that would be achievable anytime soon, which is why he alluded to when he talked to legislators about plan design. But essentially, it would not happen for FY12. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. So 
when we talk about the schools, people say, well, why don't you know, raise money? Why don't you increase fees? Why don't you go after the grants? So on this slide, you can see that we do do that. So only 86.65% of our budget is funded by the town taxes. The rest of it is related to the grants that we receive, uh, the fees that we significantly increase, and the donations that we get from uh, PTO, C, and the course. Of the so when you, again, when you look at our school budget, we, we break our school budget down the operating budget of each school, administration, and then our support services, transportation, custodians, cafeterias. It excludes the health insurance and pension. So this is the trend of the school's budget. You can see over the last few years, it's actually a slight decrease in our budget when it was out. So this, I like this slide because we had a lot of questions about what happened to that override? You know, what did you guys do with that, all that money? So if you look at this, if you look at it, you can see that in 08, we got a 3.3% core increase to our budget. Then we got the 8.7% override. Go to the next column, you see the 3.2%. We need about 3.2% on an annual basis to, to keep things flat in the school. That's about the average increase that we need that we wouldn't be cutting anything we're doing. So in FY10, we got a 2% reduction. In FY11, a 0.4% reduction. So you got to add the 0.2 reduction to the 3.2 and the 0.4 to the 3.2, and that net together is an 8.8% reduction. So to reduce everything that we got from over. Uh, we got like 10 and that So what did you cut? Well, we cut the stuff we added to the override. And some people, well, why did you do that? Well, that was the last things we cut before we got to the override. So again, that, those are the first things that go back up the door. So uh, these are a lot of numbers and you probably have it in there, but uh, I prefer to stand next to it. But, you know, uh, but if you start with the levy, as, as Trish said, uh, FY11 numbers are up there. So back in January, we had about 150 people attend our Gates meeting, and we kind of reviewed these guide books that we put up there. Best, worst, and town's second estimate. We looked at the levy, and you can see the levy doesn't fluctuate too much. We're pretty good at estimating the levy. The state aid, that moves a bit. Local receipts, again, that moved, it's actually caused some problems now. Then you get into our expenses. We're pretty good at uh, estimating the expenses that they charge you for giving us uh, the cherry sheet money. So the state gives you the cherry sheet and they charge you back money for that. Then the shared expenses, that's the big number related to uh, health insurance and pension insurance uh, and general insurance and in debt. So we bring that number down, we get to our revenue. So we're estimating <coughs> estimate, estimate back in January for 40 if you look at the first column, we ended up at 40.7858. You bring those numbers down, and you split it 66.33, approximately 34, whatever it is, right? And you split it between the town and the schools. So this time, last January, we we're estimating the schools going to get 27.254. When we, when we actually got the budget, we got 27.245. So our budget was $27,245,000. So it really is a rocket scientist, and we do a pretty good job of you know, building the guardrails and trying to figure out what, what we're dealing with. So if I, I have that yellow line there, and I pull it back over to this slide, and you say, okay, why do you have a gap? So the right side is what we're estimating as a gap for the school last January. So you take the 27.254, which is the middle estimate, you add in what our base budget was for the prior year, 27.651. So you want to, then you start at your base budget for the prior year. Then you add in your new increases. So we had our contractual increases last year. We had our step increases, and we added in $150,000 all up. So last year in January, we said we had a budget gap of 1.697. And we ended up with a budget of 1.696. And I didn't even realize it was a $1,000 difference until today. That's how close it is. Yeah, the categories move, things moved around, but ultimately, you know, since we're doing this range, we end up being pretty, pretty close. So then you said, well, what, then you look at what you cut. So I put on 10 here, because people forget about 10. The school had a big reduction in 10. So we had a uh, budget gap of $2.6 million in 10. That was that 
percent reduction, and we cut two point four million dollars out of the school budget. One point two in compensation, point three curriculum supplies are equal to two four. So this didn't hit home as much because we didn't cut the professional staff, the teachers, and specialists at the schools. But I just want to make sure people realize that happened. So in January, we, this is what we projected. We said we're going to cut one point six seven nine, and these were the three categories we said we we're going to project. Cut. We ended up cutting one point three six in compensation, eight point five. We cut the curriculum budget. We cut the little supplies we had. And the reason why we're able to not cut as many compensation is that we were able to prepay a little bit. We were able to save money in ten to pay down a level so you can buy extra paper and year end and stuff like that. So we were really tight. And if you guys are in the elementary or the gates high school, you know that you know we're begging for paper and everything every year. Uh, so ultimately, well, we said we were going to cut 1.829, we cut 1.88. So we cut a little bit more because last year we got caught. The state said they were, you know, the state had nine seat cuts in, in, in ten. So what does that mean? They came in October and said we're going to cut the, the town budget again. So the town turned around, split that deficit between school and town. We had very little deficit, very little contingency in ten. So we ended up having to make mid-year cuts, which were very difficult. So that's kind of where we are today. So these, are, those are the cuts that occurred. So we put them into a little bit more detail of what did it mean. So again, we had a layoff in 10. We had a layoff. These were not big positions, these were layoffs. Majority of them. And then you see that we reduced sections in 10, uh, and then our class sizes were growing. Classes greater than 24 and greater than 28. In 10, we came and said we're going to lay off 39 positions. 23 of them professional staff, 16 of them non-professional. We ended up laying off 30, 18 professional staff and 12 non-professional staff. Our class sizes really impacted the grades 4 through 6 in the elementary classes. So grades 4 through 6, we now have 10 classes equal to greater than 28. Uh, sorry, sorry. We, were, we have 7 classes equal to greater than 28. We were projecting 10. Again, we saved a few positions because we're back in the savings. <laughs> I'm just talking about elementary right now, just because it gets a lot of publicity, it's, it's easy to quantify. But in the handout that uh, Dr. Martin put together, there's a great handout that reviews all the cuts that were made across all the districts, at the elementary, the K, and the high school. It kind of goes to how deep they ended up going. Then our athletic fees. We said we were going to raise our fees in 10 to $200 per athlete. It was $100 per athlete. We said we were going to cut $150 thousand dollars of the athletic budget. We met with all the boosters. They worked with them. They came up with the schedule with, with, with the school committee. The raise it to 300 per sport, capped at 900 per family. That raised about $150,000. So that's why you saw on the other side like our, our fees are growing in the school. So that's what happened in 11. Uh, just one more thing that you want to just say. Oh, there you go. So, we got a lot of, you know, the first column is the year we redistricted, 2007, 2008. And then the other ones, so it's color coded, related to, so blue is Jenkins. So Jenkins has, has had the highest school classes over the last few years. But we said we were not going to redistrict for three years. So 10 would have been probably the year, 10, 11 would have been the year we looked at redistricting. But with all these cuts, we kind of redistrict by cut. So Jenkins got less of the, Hits and the cuts in 11, uh, and we, we strategically cut the even of the class sizes across uh, the schools. And then ultimately, you can see that you know, Walter Tuck ended up in the highest class in fifth grade at 30, an average of 31, and you know, half of the uh, sixth grade at 32. Uh, so, again, 12, difficult to predict, 3% didn't pass, but the <coughs> Question one did. Uh, pending, uh, pending state deficit, very worried about that. We'll get our budget, first, first week of the budget probably in January. Uh, I get nervous. What is the state going to do? They really haven't taken the hard cuts of the state, the cut local aid. You know, they talked about, when we talked about uh, the 9C cuts, they said they didn't cut education. They cut education. They cut our circuit breaker reimbursement for special ed from 75% to 33%. Huge hit. And 
then, you know, as they're going to present 12, you know, many years are probably businessmen, somebody do both for kind of like This is the third year we're looking at layoffs. If we were running a business, you should fire me. But, you know, we're trying to maximize the resources each year. But can you imagine in your work, if every year you were going through the same process again and there's no pending layoffs? So we just got through, we just opened up the school, going through all the layoffs. And we're talking our second school committee meeting about doing another layout. So it, it's tough on schools, I'm not crying or anything, but it, it, it is, it adds a lot of stress and tension to administrators and teachers and everybody working. So again, if you walk through the numbers here, same exact spreadsheet, you know, we're a little bit off where I am Patricia. I'm probably a little bit more optimistic than when I put this presentation together, and I, especially related to how the, uh, the governor election went. I do feel a little nervous about these numbers. But again, if you start with the levy, you know, I'm, we're pretty good at projecting that. The state aid, I think I'm probably optimistic. You know, I have it at 0% here, from the two, uh, which really is, Trish came in at four, I was estimating chapter 70, which is the largest piece to be at zero. Uh, both of them get zero. Uh, and then you drop down to the expense lines, and ultimately, you get to the split. So at this split here, my best town estimate at this time would say it's pretty much flat funding to the schools. I'd probably say right now I'm quite a little bit optimistic. Best case is a 2% increase. Worst case is negative 6 6.1%. So then you carry that over again and say, okay, that's what your budget is. Go back to your base budget for 11. You're adding what we know is going to happen. So. We have our contractual increases again, we have our step increases again. We have an elimination of the hour grant. So people say they didn't cut chapter 70. Well, they cut chapter 70 two years ago, but then they made you apply for an hour grant equal to exactly what they cut chapter 70 for. And now that money is gone. So again, you know, they say they don't do this, but they actually do. The elimination of uh, the job grant. So this was, you know, the job grant just passed. So people say, Town's getting the job grant, we're able to reinstitute, hopefully some teachers and some classes. School committee elected not to use the money this year. First of all, we haven't received the money. I'm not sure exactly what the number is. We are informed of it after the school year had opened. We decided that we're better to use that money in 2012 instead of hiring someone now and possibly having that play off that beat person in nine months. So yeah, the 250 is what we're estimating when we get to the job grant. And then ultimately, all other So again, same thing, if you look at, you know, the same exact grid for now, you know, it's a 12% gap. We're going back to, you know, pre-override now, over our money. Uh, then if you look at, if you look at the cumulative over the three years, if you add, add up the, the gap that we solved, I mean, and some of them were one-time expenses, so it's not, it's not quite cutting it all out because, in 11, when you look, sorry, in, uh, in 10, when you look at the compensation reduction, 750,000 of that was a one-time reduction from the unions all day for reason that year. But if you add it together, you can see that we're ultimately at about a $5.3 million cut from what we expect to be at a level set budget for those schools. And high-level estimate of what would we cut. There's no curriculum money left, we cut it all. You know, we're hoping to have a little bit of money left over at the end of the year, maybe if we manage really well to prepay something. So we're back in the compensation line, and we think we're having to cut on another $1.2 million out of that compensation line. So they roll that over. What does it mean? And that's dating uh, another 16 professional staff and six non professional staff. I would say this is pure. I, when I present this, this is me downloading all the school schedules. Rolling classes forward, and then building a little program saying if I reduce one teacher, does it go above 30, 34 kids in the class? If it doesn't, I leave it, I say we can cut that. That's, that's about as you know, um, technical as I'm getting on this. A lot of decisions are made by the principal, so and so, but when you do it, you have to come up with a number of $1.2 million savings. You're not saving that kind of money unless you're cutting professional staff. So ultimately, as I showed you at 11, came pretty close to estimating the right number. So then ultimately, another 16 professional staff, 
and uh, so ultimately counting 34 over the last, last two years, another six non-professional staff, a total of 65. If you look at, now you go down to the reduction sections, we're reducing another eight sections in the elementary school. So again, 16 teacher professional staff, we're only reducing eight sections. So I'm not really sure where the other eight are coming from, but I can only take eight out of the elementary <coughs> So, and then if you look at our class size, as you can see, in grade four through six, we're going from seven classes that are in the equally greater than 28 to 14 classes equally greater than 28. So pretty much the majority of all of them. And then classes one through three, that's where we're going to be really taking the next hit, is that a lot of these classes will be equally greater than 24 or eight of them. Uh, you know, you can see it's a just question mark. I don't know what we're, else we're going to cut at elementary. I don't know what we're going to cut at Gates. And we had an extremely difficult time making the cuts at the high school this year because we were running into graduation credit requirements for the, for the students. So we actually had to add something back last year uh, because we were running out, of, we had a credit problem for the students to be able to graduate. Athletic fees, I put a question mark there, the booster people here, they'd probably kill me because they all said if you raise these fees by $150,000, please don't come back again next year. So I think that's a pretty hard thing to go back and ask them to uh, pay more for athletics. But, So again, just looking at the class sizes again, you know, you can see that from fourth to sixth grade, there'll be 29 to 33 classes and kids in the class. And you can see from the first to the third grade, you know, it's 23 in the first, the high up to 26 in the third grade. So again, solve the gap. I mean, these are high level. So this presentation, we gave this presentation, I'm glad to see more people here tonight, I wish it was even more. We gave this present, presentation on the 4th to the school committee, advertising it, trying to get up the world, where we had about 15 people show up for this that meeting. So we have a count of about 60 here. Uh, but this is the problem we're facing. You know, when we presented the Levin budget last year, we felt horrible about the cuts that were going to happen. But we knew we could make them. We knew we could get to them. We were meeting in July because as soon as this budget was put together in the last year, we had a big problem for 12. And I just don't know, I don't know how to get to these numbers. So we're putting these on here, but operationally, the impact, we're not really sure how we're going to get to these numbers. That's the school.
change positions. I don't get it. But we're t what if, what, we're not designating it for a specific position. If you designate it to the school budget as a whole, and then it gets decided where it goes. Well, that, that's what they're doing. That's what we're that doing. is doable? That's what they're doing. Yes. So, so we did actually ask last year for a donation. So any of those organizations that raise money for paper and other, you know, other supplies, we could instead donate it to the town, to the school budget as a, a direct donation to the school budget on, on, on a higher level, not specify any conditions, and it could filter down into saving positions, theoretically. You won't earmark it for paper and glue. We won't earmark it for anything. It did so, okay. So instead of on a big picture then, if nobody's going to take on a, a, an override question, is if there was an effort to do a major fundraiser for school, the school budget itself is, I'm mean, just talking theoretically, if it was just a school budget fundraiser effort, that money could be donated to the school budget at the highest level, which then you could filter down to saving actual positions. Yes, there, yes. 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 Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> When you get your budget and you give it to the principals, who gets the final say on, because it looks like you've already got, for year two, 2012 now, how many classrooms and grades will be affected specifically for those classroom sizes? Or who gets to decide? Is it the principal decides per school which grade will get affected with the 30 plus So grade? again, I want to be clear, this is me, right, building right, a program right. and taking and choosing. That's why I'm asking. So, right, so no, school administration, we approve a number, the yeah. school, school committee approves the budget. Right. The school administration builds the budget. Okay, so the school administration says between these four elementary schools or this eight <coughs> school, high school, I need each principal to take out five positions. Who decides that? The administrator? Well, usually the, you know, the, the, the principals work together. So the elementary school people work very close together. Okay. If you go online, we have a, we have actually a school improvement plan for each of the for the elementaries as a whole. And you can see in that the plan was actually to make sure we equal the services across all the elementary classes. So we're trying to equal up elementary class sizes. You can see that the specialists are adjusted based upon number of students in each class. Psychologists, reading specialists, math specialists. So they work together to try to allocate the resources so they're equally distributed across all the schools. Okay. How, if, we, if, if now we get to this point of where are the next cuts going to come from, if, say, all the one through three year experience teachers were gone in each school. I was under the impression that we are now at a tenured position in a lot of the schools, so how do those cuts come next? Like, how do you go from a seven position in one school to 14? No, if there's a layout, and we go through the professional position, we right. buy. Number of years. Mm -hmm. No, but it's also by all the contractual right. obligations. Okay. Is it? Yeah. And you have to get the qualifications. Just one more quick comment. As, as Bill alluded to a second ago, um, we talked about the contract on the school side, I mean, the town side. The school side contract is one more year. 2012 is the last year that the teachers are under contract. So, they had a, uh, like a three, three, zero, three, 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 and then the second year they took their 3% cut and they pushed it out to 12, and they took zero in 2010. So this is the last year, not 11, we're in 11 now, so next year is the last year for their contract, and then that will be up for negotiations. Unfortunately, you know, the school committee's hands are kind of tied because the contract has been in place and that's the numbers that Bill's working with. One other comment that I wanted to bring up is, when you talk about layoffs, it also has a double impact on the budget because your unemployment expense goes up. So you've got, you know, you've got two forces working against you when you lay off somebody. Um, not only do you lose the services, but you also increase your unemployment expenses. And you know, that's only projected as best as we can in the budget. So we see that you know, that goes up tremendously when, when layoffs occur. I just want to 
publicly thank Bill and the entire school committee and Sue and Paul and everybody for the number of meetings you guys have attended, gone to all the different PTOs, all the different school councils, pushing public meeting to do this same presentation to try to raise awareness for two years about this issue. So I appreciate Bob for so two years ago, you know, we, we thought we did a good job communicating. So that last year we did attend over 20 meetings. And the result was kind of the same. So this year we said, you know what, we're going to move it up even earlier to try to get awareness out further. So we do hope there's a little bit more awareness and um, grassroots around the problem we have and, is, and try to help us with these solutions. Great. Um, my name is Don Nelson, 16 years on the road. I also echo the thank you that everyone up here is doing because we're fighting a hard battle and I'm really thankful for everything we get. I'd love to see this place packed, you know, for a meeting that's this important. Um, my question is about the race to the top that we were denied. Are we going to reapply for that? And how much will it be? And can you comment on it? Thank you. Well, we applied, but the, uh, you know, the SDA did not sign the, uh, the race to the top. So therefore, we, 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 were not, we weren't able to participate. Our, our application was incomplete. So unless the, in many MTA unions or mass teachers subunions did not sign on. So ours is one of the groups that did not sign on. So we, we, we were incomplete, we didn't qualify for funds. But we did apply. I was under the impression that you could reapply and appeal for that. We can reapply if the SDA would sign. No, even if they don't sign. That was my impression from what I've been able to get on the internet. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. I mean, we can, go, I, we can go back and look, but we did apply. We received notification and we didn't receive it. Uh, but if you think that we can reapply, we'll go we'll check the website again and look at it. Thank you. Any other questions on any of the budget issues because we're going to go into the special town meeting warrant? <clears throat> Don't be shy. Yes, sir.
And if the circuit breaker went from a 70% university to 33%, can you correlate that in terms of dollars to what things were unanticipated? These matters came to the bottom Just a four hundred and something thousand dollar line thousand at the top of the school to the top. So yeah, just so everybody understand that they anticipate the state's gonna reimburse the seventy five percent. They build their budget to that degree. They wait, they submit their forms, they do exactly what they're supposed to do when the state turns around and says, sorry fellas, get four hundred and instead of red. Okay. The worst thing about this is they did the part of line C, they did it in October after we're running the budget. And they said they didn't cut education. And you went down the line on the increase from we're supposed to reimburse hundred percent, but never really been more than seventy five. But to take it from seventy five to thirty eight percent was really tough. I mean we talked to all the legislation, legislative about it. The other point, those aren't optional. Those are state mandated. So they mandate that you do it. They say they're going to fund it at one level, and then they, they don't fund it at, at the level that they tell you to. And then you know, the school committee has to deal with the shortfall. And the majority of circuit breaker are children with special ed needs that we cannot uh, teach within the school district. Most of them are shipped out to the Carroll School of Hawaii or disabled schools around, the, around Massachusetts that are not. We don't teach them within, within the city of public school systems, but we're responsible for paying for their education. Can you clarify, Bill, in terms of why our application was denied? Can you tell us what we need to sign on and what the rationale for not signing on? I can't give you the rationale. Uh, the SDA, the Teachers Union, MTA, well, the MTA was the leader of it, but ultimately our SDA did not sign the agreement, sign the race for the top. And this language, I don't know, so many good. Handle both maybe the rich, but the language in there related to, I don't know. Uh, Student achievement time to teacher evaluations. Teacher evaluations. What's the typical award that you see for classes that were accepted in the group and received those funds? A similar, similar size. Can I just make one quick comment before? I mean, you look at the numbers here, you see the town has a shortfall and the school has a shortfall. Um, the obvious answer is an override. This town does not pass overrides easily. I see a few, few people in the audience that have run some in the past. And it takes a lot of support and a lot of energy for an override to even get <clears throat> on, the, on the horizon so people see it. So if you see what's happening here and you don't like it and you think an override is the solution, um, and I don't know that it is or not because it's, people are having tough financial times individually and I don't know if they can afford an override either. But there's got to be an effort from the community to A, show that you want it, and B, show that you're going to run it and go out there and get the votes. Because there are going to be a certain number of no votes regardless of what you do. So um, I think that's been the question that Bill's not saying, but last year they did all these presentations. They thought there was an appetite for an override and nobody ended up going out and doing anything about it. Um, so, each school, each individual has got to go out there and test, test the waters and see if, if there's an appetite for it. If it is, you've got to get a group together that want to work it and, and see if you can get it to pass. Um, the long-term problem here is deterioration of the town services, both on the, on the um, town side and the school side. Public service will decrease. If you have to cut $200,000 out of a budget, it's eventually going to come out of people and services. The school, the same thing. You see them cutting teachers. That group of people does not want to lay off teachers. And they have had to for the last three years. Um, and as your school system and your town decreases in your services, your value of your property goes down. And since it's not an attractive place to live as much as it was you know, five years ago. So um, I think you got to really think long term and you got to. Um, if you want something to occur that's going to help the town, you got to work for it. you got to put the energy into it. So, um, you know, if that's what you want, you got to get a group of people together to, to talk about it and work on it. I totally agree with what Tony's saying, and I think, 
you know, the resounding comment that comes time and time again is the one thing that the citizens can't control and can't have any involvement in is the union contracts. And so when you're thinking about passing a $3 million, $2 million override that sadly can quickly be diminished in a union contract negotiation, it's hard to pass that cost on to the taxpayers. And it's at no fault of anyone at the front of this room. But as my phone rings and as others in the room who helped with the last override to say, hey, what's the deal? Are we going to do another one? The fact of the matter is, when we can't control that piece of it, it's, it's a major non-incentive to want to get involved in it again. And it's, again, at no fault of any person that's sitting at the front of this room. But it's, I would say that that's a big piece of the puzzle that is precluding this from happening. Thank you. you. You should all have, or you could have grabbed a copy of the uh, advisory uh, committee report, uh, which uh, details and provides commentary on the uh, special town meeting articles uh, that are coming before the town for vote on Monday the 8th. Uh, if there are any questions or, or points of clarification on the warrant, I know we have a few people here who are subject experts. Um, we'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank everyone for coming, um, and you know, get the word out there about the condition of the town, and hopefully we can get uh, you know larger turnouts for future meetings. Um, it gets discussed quite a bit at the school committee meetings, and the selectmen meetings, and at the advisory committee meetings. Um, and obviously, you can email us or contact us as you see us on the street. But um, thank you all for coming, and I hope you all attend the meeting on Monday night for the special town meeting. There are um, you know some financial articles on there, some green issue articles on there, and then there's the CPC article and the one that um, Amanda McDivis mentioned about the um, extra contributions for schools. So, hope to see you Monday night.